Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Well, welcome to the MIT Faculty Forum Online. I'm Troy Van Voris, Department Head and Haslam and Dewey Professor for the MIT Department of Chemistry, and it's my pleasure to moderate today's webcast, which is sponsored in part by the MIT Federal Credit Union, MIT Professional Education, and the MIT Sloan Executive Education. I know all of you have been impacted by COVID-19 in myriad ways, and MIT chemistry is no different. Uh, we recently dramatically ramped down our research efforts for about two months and are only just now beginning to ramp up. Uh, but of course, MIT is great at solving huge challenging problems and COVID-19 is no different. We are here today to hear from five chemistry faculty who will share the research their labs are contributing to fight against COVID-19, understanding the virus and how it works and helping design new therapeutics. And I'm sure I don't need to tell this audience that basic science is critical to understanding and ultimately controlling this devastating virus. Where would we be without our chemists and biologists? Now, as a reminder, we welcome your questions during this event. Questions should be asked using the Q&A tool. The comments box is intended for that purpose only, that is for comments. After our lightning talks today, our faculty will host breakout rooms to field further questions you might have. Uh, and all registrants should have received these breakout room links in the confirmation email this morning, and we'll share them again in the Zoom chat now. And now I am delighted to introduce our five faculty speakers for today. Um, May Hong, Laura Kiesling, Brad Pentaluti, Alex Shalik, and Tim Swagger. First, May Hong, uh, after a one-year postdoctoral stint at MIT, May started her independent career at Iowa State University uh, before returning to MIT chemistry as a full professor in 2014. May's research focuses on the development and application of solid state NMR spectroscopy to elucidate the structure, dynamics, and mechanism of action of biological macromolecules, with particular emphasis on membrane proteins. In the latter category, she's elucidated the structure and dynamics of the influenza M2 protein, viral fusion proteins, and antimicrobial peptides. Her group is now leveraging this long-standing expertise in virus membrane proteins to determine the structure and drug binding of one of the three SARS-CoV-2 membrane proteins, the envelope protein. Second, we'll be hearing from Laura Kiesling, uh, who got her bachelor's in chemistry, course five from MIT. Laura is now the Novartis Professor of Chemistry. Uh, she's also an institute member of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Laura's interdisciplinary research interests focus on the mechanisms of cell surface recognition processes, especially those involving protein glycan interactions, as well as multivalency and its role in recognition, signal transduction, transduction and direction of cell fate. Third, you'll be hearing, we'll be hearing from Brad Pedaluti. Brad is an associate professor of chemistry with tenure. Uh, he's also an associate member of the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT, an extramural member of the MIT Koch Cancer Institute, and a member of the Center for Environmental Health Sciences at MIT. He joined the Department of Chemistry at MIT in 2011, and his lab invents new protein modification chemistries, adapts nature's biological machines for efficient drug delivery into cells, and creates new technologies to rapidly manufacture peptides and proteins. Next, we'll be hearing from Alex Shalik. Alex is the Pfizer Lobach Career Development Associate Professor of Chemistry at MIT, as well as a core member of the Institute for Medical Engineering Science, uh, also known as IMES, and an extramural member of the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. He's also an associate member of the Reagan Institute and an institute member uh, of the Broad Institute and, and an assistant in immunology at MGH and an instructor in, health, instructor in health sciences and technology at HMS. Alex joined the Department of Chemistry at MIT in 2014, and his research is directed toward the development and application of new approaches to elucidate cellular and molecular features that inform tissue level function and dysfunction across the spectrum of human health and disease. And the final person we'll hear from is Tim Swagger. Tim is the John D. MacArthur Professor of Chemistry and the director of the Despande Center for Technological Innovation at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. 
After a postdoctoral appointment at MIT, he joined the chemistry faculty uh, at the University of Pennsylvania before returning to MIT in 1996. Uh, and I'll note that he served in particular as the, the head of our department from 2005 to 2010. Tim's research interests are in the design, synthesis, and study of organic-based electronic sensory high-strength liquid crystalline and, cell and colloid materials. His inventions have had wide-ranging commercial impact, including the FIDO sensors, which are the world's most sensitive explosives detectors. He's the scientific founder of five companies uh, and has served on numerous corporate and government boards. Uh, please join me in welcoming all of our speakers. Uh, and now we will transition to our first speaker, uh, who is Professor May Hong. Uh, I'll hand it over to May, and I'll just remind you, remind you that after each presentation, questions may be asked uh, using the Q&A tool. So thank you, May. Let's give a virtual round of applause to May and uh, take it away. Thank you, Troy. Um, can you see my uh, slide okay? Okay. All right. Um, so developing antiviral drugs and vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 requires a structural understanding of the essential proteins of the virus. Uh, this virus makes three membrane proteins, the spike protein that you see on the virus uh, surface, uh, the matrix protein that organizes uh, virus assembly, and the envelope protein, which mediates virus spreading. And this envelope protein is the target of my lab's COVID-19 research. So uh, these three membrane proteins orchestrate their actions at different stages of the SARS-CoV-2 life cycle. The spike protein recognizes cell surface ACE2 receptors to mediate virus entry. Once inside the cell, the viral RNA is uh, replicated and transcribed and viral protein synthesized. And the matrix protein then organizes, uh, assembles these new viral RNAs and proteins in this compartment of the cell called ERGIC. Um, and here, the envelope protein acts by making sure that the new virion buds into the lumen of ERGIC so that the virion can then be exported out of the cell. So um, the envelope protein mediates virus budding, and recombinant viruses that lack this E protein have been shown to have aberrant morphology, um, immature virion, and have less ability to propagate. So E deletion uh, mutant is a, a, a vaccine uh, candidate. Uh, in addition, this envelope protein also forms a cation channel, and particularly its calcium uh, conducting activity uh, is uh, linked to the cell's overstimulated inflama uh, inflammation response to the virus. So if we can uh, stop this uh, cation channel by um, small molecule drugs, such as this uh, hexamethylene amyloride shown here, then we have a potential inhibitor against SARS-CoV-2. And this hexamethylene amyloride has been uh, listed as one of the uh, compounds under preclinical uh, studies. So uh, clearly, uh, detailed atomic level structural information would be very useful for developing better and more potent drugs to block this uh, SARS-CoV uh, ion channel. Uh, and uh, since 2003, the first SARS outbreak, there has been a small literature growing around this E protein, and it's thought to be a pentameric channel, but not much detail is known which lip residues, uh, amino acid residues, face the channel lumen versus the lipids, and which residues bind drug is really unclear. So my lab is leveraging our expertise in studying this uh, equivalent ion channel in flu viruses, this M2 protein, to now rapidly study the SARS-CoV uh, uh, envelope uh, channel. Uh, in flu viruses, M2 makes a tetrameric uh, proton conducting channel. And just this year, in February, we reported uh, two atomic resolution structures of the influenza B viruses M2 protein. Uh, and comparisons of this uh, uh, closed state and the open state of this channel is very useful uh, for telling us how this protein activates to uh, permeate or, or to uh, conduct protons and what are the uh, possible uh, small molecules that could plug either uh, state of this channel. So now uh, these structures were solved in phospholipid bilayers using uh, solid state NMR, which is a non-perturbing spectroscopic tool to look at um, at the atomic level, uh, the structures of various molecules. And we put our membrane samples into the center of large superconducting magnets such as this one. And we uh, then apply radio frequency electromagnetic pulses to interrogate atomic nuclei such as carbon-13, nitrogen-15, and protons. Now, in order to get um, high resolution spectra, we uh, need to spin our samples in these uh, little uh, cylindrical rotors to speeds as fast as uh, 1 million RPM. Uh, and uh, then we get uh, uh, detailed atom-specific uh, structural information. 
Uh, now, in order to apply this very sophisticated uh, spectroscopic method, we have to first obtain purified protein. And so this is the effort of two people in my lab. In the first two and a half months of the COVID lockdown, Matt McKay and Shiva Mandela worked very hard to clone, express, and purify this E protein. And uh, they succeeded in getting purified uh, both transmembrane domain as well as the full length E protein. As you can see from this, uh, these SDS page gels and HPLCs, we get pretty pure protein now. And indeed, our very first uh, NMR sample into the magnet um, for the E-transmembrane peptide bound to the uh, ERGIC lipid mixture uh, on a 900 megahertz NMR, we get very high sensitivity as well as very well-resolved spectra. And so these fingerprint carbon-13 and nitrogen 15 spectra uh, is a very promising start for us to move on to uh, in just in the last uh, week uh, to measure a lot of 2D uh, correlation as well as 3D correlation spectra. So we can get all the uh, chemical shifts of the carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 of the transmembrane domain of this uh, E protein. Uh, in order to assign all of these signals to the uh, protein sequence, we have to do 3D correlation experiments, which uh, we have done now. Uh, so now we know exactly you know, which signals come from which residues in the protein. And so now we know that uh, residues 15 to 35 of the transmembrane domain are alpha helical, and moreover, we have measured uh, the uh, helix orientation by looking at the backbone NH bond orientation in the membrane. And so this is just preliminary data analysis to be refined, but roughly we know that the he helices are tilted by about 22 degrees, uh, and uh, we know which residues now face the channel lumen. So uh, this, as I speak today, we will be looking at the first inhibitor bound uh, state of the sample so we can determine the drug binding site. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to acknowledge the two people Matt McKay and Shiva Mandela for very fast action in the last three months, as well as my long distance collaborator in Singapore, Jean Torres, who produced uh, one of the uh, longer constructs of the E protein uh, for us to uh, do structural analysis. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm happy to answer uh, questions. Oh, well, thank you, May. Let's give uh, another virtual round of applause to May there. Um, I, since I'm the moderator, I get the uh, the 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 right right to ask the first question. Uh, there's already a couple up, but I actually was curious, May. How what you know? I, I know that it requires a whole lot of structural information actually to do to deduce a functional structural model for the for these uh, membrane brown proteins. About what percentage of the data that we need in order to deduce a structure do we have at this point? Um. I think now we actually have 50% of the information for the transmembrane domain, which is the drug binding uh, region of the protein. Um, and uh, this uh, um, relatively fast production is directly because uh, related to the fact that we recently just determined the full structure of BM2, and that was like a practice run for this one. And so we got, we got lucky that in two and a half months, we were able to purify the protein. Oftentimes, the biochemical step is the unknown aspect. You know, you don't know how, how, how much you're going to make. You know, for NMR, we need a milligram quantities, and we have succeeded in that. So uh, the NMR data that I showed came from about one and a half weeks uh, of effort. So this part actually is going pretty quickly. Yeah, so I... Uh, and so, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so in the next few weeks, I, I hope to get uh, drug binding site information. Yeah. Uh, so here's one question that she might, uh, that, that's, uh, that's about the ACE2 domain. So it, the question is, if ACE2, uh, which, is, which is one of the targeted domains, is ubiquitous uh, among several organs uh, and is the receptor for infection, why is, the, why is it that uh, pulmonary disease and not renal, GI, or cardiac, the major disease of, of COVID-19. Uh, I think here the idea is that, you know, if this, if this domain appears everywhere, why doesn't the, this, this, this virus uh, attack all of those? Yeah, so um, the, I, I don't know the detail of how widespread the ACE2 receptor is. Um, my uh, people can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm wondering if ACE2 receptor is more common in the lung cells and the, basically the cell, cell types in the upper and lower respiratory uh, tracts. Uh, and ACE2 is recognized by the spike protein, which is, you know, specific to the coronaviruses. Uh, the envelope protein is not involved in the cell surface, you know, recognition aspect. It is involved in the uh, virus budding aspect. So when a new progeny virus is made, it needs to get out of the cell to go on and infect the next one, next cell. And if you can actually stop that, then each virus can at most hurt only one cell. And right now that propagation is, is the bad part. Um, so yeah. 
So I think Alex Shalak may, may you know, say more about the, the spike protein recognition ACE2 receptor. I, I don't know. Or um, Laura would also probably have data on that, right? I will in my talk. Thanks, May. And you, we found ACE2 is expressed across a number of different tissue compartments, very often localized to specific cells, which I'll bring up, but it's not in all tissues. And that explains some of the links between uh, the molecular events that May just talked about and some of the uh, cellular events um, and the phenotypes that we see uh, in the clinic. All right, I have uh, another uh, a good technical question for you. So the question was, was the, were the NMR uh, spectra uh, captured at room temperature? And is there any advantage to doing the experiment at lower temperatures to freeze the conformation of the molecule, maybe to get more detail uh, in the, in the, in the, in the yeah, results? Um, I'm sure uh, lower temperature data would be useful, particularly for addressing the cytoplasmic domain, which is the part apparently that is uh, important for causing the, all this uh, interesting membrane curvature in order to bud the virus out of the ERGIC lumen. Now for the transmembrane domain though, I, based on our uh, data on the, uh, this peptide, it is relatively well ordered already at room temperature. So if you freeze, you, I imagine you'll get more or less similar data. But the cytoplasmic part, which we need to study using the full length protein that we made. That's the part that would be interesting and can potentially benefit from very low temperature data. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, a question of how, about, uh, again, a technical question of how, how if, you, if you can give a layman description, uh, how do you get the pure samples of your protein for NMR analysis? Is this the hardest part of the research for you? To me, as a physical chemist, I feel like that's the hardest part and the least predictable. Uh, and uh, so we uh, produce this uh, purified E by using a sumo fusion uh, tag. Um, and that sumo made this uh, membrane protein quite well soluble. So we expressed it uh, in the cells, both the cytoplasm uh, and the actually in the membrane pellet region. In the end, they come out of HPLC looking uh, similar, whichever uh, part of the uh, cell you extract. So um, with sumo, uh, fusion expression, you can get relatively large quantities and then you cleave and this cleavage also worked well. We are using exactly the same way we produce BM2 to produce this uh, E protein. So now this E protein has some complicated aspect. It has multiple cysteines, which can make disulfide bonds. So, you know, that part uh, we, we don't know yet. You know, it, it can, um, the uh, extra membrane piece can, can uh, be lipid tagged and so on. So there's a lot of complicated uh, biology and structural aspect that we are uh, yet to get to. Uh, but I think the transmembrane domain, this calcium channel domain, uh, will be the, the first part we address. Um, so we're moving on to the full length protein also now. We have started uh, those experiments, but I don't have much to, to report yet. All right. Well, thank you, May. Uh, I see there's more questions in the chat, but we ha will have to move on for time reasons. So let's thank May again. Uh, and uh, our next speaker uh, is Laura Kiesling, uh, and I invite her to, uh, th to take the helm and give her presentation. Uh, thanks, Troy. And uh, thanks for putting this together, Liz. Uh, it's really fun to be able to talk about our research in this way. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, more taking off of what May said about the spike protein. And that's this little protein uh, shown here on this iconic picture of the virus now, um, this red part. And that spike protein is what's critical, as May described, for entry into the cell. And the work I'm going to talk about was spearheaded by the two postdocs and one graduate student shown here. So um, we tend to, actually, sorry, let me figure out how to advance my slides. Um, we tend to think about um, this spike protein as this upright little picture here, but let me show you what this looks like. So the protein part is shown in red and white, and um, the carbohydrates are in this kind of purple and green mossy structure. So what you can see is carbohydrates just coat the surface of this virus. And actually, that's something that my lab has been studying for a long time. So basically, every cell on our planet wears a coat of carbohydrates, shown here by this little sort of fuzzy uh, stuff on top of the world. Um, and that includes many enveloped viruses also have this carbohydrate coat. And we've been studying the human proteins um, called lectins, which are carbohydrate binding proteins inside of us 
that are responsible for recognition of this. And they can mediate cell-cell binding, they can mediate signaling, and they can also um, help us distinguish pathogens from, um, for example, um, commensals, microbes that live within us. Um, and so infection depends, as May told you, on the interaction of this spike protein on the surface of the virus with ACE2. And um, I, this is not my movie. It's taken uh, from these papers listed here, but I love it because it shows the different carbohydrates on the surface of the spike protein and the carbohydrates on the surface of the ACE2 receptor. And what you can see is that there are really important interactions there. And so glycosylation is really important for impacting which parts of the protein we choose for vaccines. Um, they, glycans or the carbohydrates on the protein can influence our own immune response. Um, they're important. They play a role in the affinity of ACE2 for this um, spike protein. And they're critical for uh, antibody tests and therapeutic antibodies, that is for convalescent um, serology. So we don't know right now. Um, first of all, antibody tests um, are not good. If anyone saw the 60 Minutes sto story last night, they just talk about how poor the antibody tests are. And uh, virtually none of the antibody tests take into account this glycosylation state. And it's also critical for identifying those therapeutic antibodies. So as I said, antibody tests are not predictive. And what you can see here are just the common modes of antibody um, testing, you typically coat a well with a bait protein, and that's often the spike protein. And then you um, add the patient sera, the patient antibodies, and then detect them. So if you don't have the right state of the protein here, you're not gonna be identifying the relevant antibodies. And that's true for both formats of this test. And these tests don't consider the glycosylation of the virus, which is not very easy to determine from the DNA sequence of the virus. And that's because the virus goes into our cells and it uses our glycosylation machinery. And one thing that people have seen is people with different blood types may have different susceptibility to the coronavirus. Whoops, I'm going backwards. I apologize for that. I don't quite know. Okay, so spike glycosylation can vary at different sites. And so we wanted to understand how glycosylation impacts um, all these different tests. And as I said, all over the protein are these uh, glycans. So how could we do this? And we have uh, looked into, we have been developing this new strategy called lectin fingerprinting. So in lectin fingerprinting, um, we use these carbohydrate binding proteins to get a profile of what the viral spike protein looks like or what the virus itself looks like. And this is a powerful way, again, one lectin or one carbohydrate binding protein isn't good enough to tell us what the state is, but if we have a variety of them, we can develop this kind of fingerprint and understand then how the different uh, viru virus or recombinant proteins that we're using match up to the virus. So um, I've also highlighted in here this uh, receptor binding domain. This is the part of the virus that binds to the ACE2 receptor. And you can see all around it are these different sugars. And you can take um, the receptor binding domain and many viral tests or many antibody tests rely only on this part of the viral spike protein. And we can actually um, tell the difference between a viral spike protein that's made in one cell type versus another. And the way we do this, again, is this lectin fingerprinting. So we take a variety of these proteins that have different specificities, and then we read out a profile of let's say either different um, recombinant receptor binding domains, different recombinant spike proteins, or different viruses. So let me just show you what we've found so far. Um, and uh, I'll just point out that um, we have a variety of these different tools and we understand their specificities. 
So here's an example where, as I said, we compared the receptor binding domain um, that was produced in hex cells versus the receptor binding domain that was prepared in insect cells. And both of these um, have been used by people to study viral recognition. And you can see in our lectin profile, they give rise to very different um, profiles. And what else is interesting is that full length spike and um, pseudovirus, that is a non-toxic version of the coronavirus, also give different profiles. So we can begin to use these now as tools to go in and ask how do clinical samples vary from these sorts of recombinant proteins that people are using for all of their antibody tests. And we think this will be important for, as I said, identifying therapeutic antibodies and um, sera. Now, one of the um, cool things that we found about this is um, Amanda, Mike, and Melanie asked the question, um, are these uh, lectins, these carbohydrate binding proteins, actually competing with therapeutic antibodies? Do they bind at the same site? And the answer we found is yes. So we found that antibodies that bind to either the receptor binding domain or full length spike are competitors with the lectins. And we also found that the um, ACE2 receptor is a competitor with the lectins. You can see that here. And the reason that's exciting is it suggests that lectins themselves could be therapeutics, could block the spike protein from interacting with its target. So we think that these are great tools, not only for fingerprinting the virus, but also as potential therapeutics. So um, all of you listening probably know how great it is to have a team of talented people to work with. This is a picture of my lab that includes graduate students, postdocs, and our amazing MIT undergrads. Um, I'm really grateful for, to them uh, for everything that they've done. We have some fantastic collaborators, including Professor um, Imperiali and Deb Hung, both of whom helped with this project, but also many other people at MIT and beyond. So um, I'll end there and just take any questions. All right, thank, thank you, Laura. Let's, uh, let's give her uh, a round of virtual applause also. Um, so you've already, there's already a bunch of questions, so I will, I will forego my right of asking the first question and go straight to the ones from the Q&A. Um, uh, so what, the first question I'll ask is, uh, it, how does the virus end up displaying the glycans of the host's blood cells? Um, and, uh, yeah. Okay, so the virus, when it infects um, cells, it uses the host's machinery um, to make its own sugars. So um, the, the link to blood group, we don't fully understand, but that may be because different people, depending on their blood group, have different glycosylation machinery. So what that means is that if you have, you know, let's say blood type A, you might have different combinations of like glycosylation machinery, so your virus may look different than if you have blood type AB, for example. Great, yes, and, and, and in your answer there, you also answered one of the other questions, which was about the blood type dependence, so great job. Uh, uh, another uh, quite technical questions, um, uh, which, uh, which is, uh, what types of assays do you use to measure competition between lectins and antibodies? Yeah, so we typically use um, ELISA assays. So our lectins have a biotin group on them, and then we can use, we can come in with streptavidin linked to a reporter. And so it's a very simple assay. It can be done on extremely high throughput um, levels, and so that's basically how we measure. Um, and then uh, one last question, which I think will be our last one here, but. Uh, you, which, which you may have touched on uh, after the question was asked, but you can, I'll give you a chance to, to elaborate it. Um, and that is, do ABO lectin profiles enhance infectivity and viral replication? And if so, does that have therapeutic implications? I think you said at the end that maybe the answer is yes, but I wanted to give you a chance to elaborate. 
Yeah, I think we don't, I mean, I, I think that we don't know um, exactly what the mechanism is. So I would be loath to uh, speculate too much. And I will say that um, there, the paper that, or the preprint that came out with that information um, is still undergoing review. So I, I think that there's a potential link, but I wanna be careful about making it sound too strong. Um, so I'll just, I'll just say that that's still being investigated. And again, I think we need uh, better antibody tests to be able to understand those sorts of links. All right. Well, thank you, Laura. That was a great presentation. Thank you for, uh, for all of that. Uh, and now we'll move on to our next presenter, uh, who is Brad Pentaluti, who, uh, Brad, I'll ask you to step up to the virtual podium. Uh, and uh, I'll hand the mic over to you. Thank you for uh, getting on this uh, call today, this Zoom meeting. Um, I just want to start with the acknowledgement slide today. Um, you know, it's been really remarkable pretty much since uh, ever since the day that MIT decided to send everyone home. Uh, the folks in my laboratory listed over here on the, on the left side immediately raised their hand and, and said, how can I help? And uh, it started with 8 a.m. Zoom calls every day of the week, all the way through the weekend. And folks just doing everything they can to try to figure out how they can help it uh, at all levels, postdocs and uh, uh, graduate students. And then uh, we really scoured the US, if not the world at this stage for collaborators, especially to uh, test some of our compounds and uh, actually uh, BL3 labs. Uh, folks such as Ben Tenover, who has a uh, uh, one of the first uh, coronavirus infection uh, models set up in uh, in New York and Manhattan, and then uh, David Ho, for instance, at Columbia has really uh, looked at some of the compounds that we've been making, and then locally we've worked a lot with Near Howcome at the Broad and and uh, Raphael and uh, Material Science Department here at MIT, and so it's just been a really um, you know, a, a difficult time, but uh, we're trying to make progress. And so I'll show you kind of what, what emerged in my group actually about five years ago. Uh, this comes from the Department of Defense. They, they actually wanted us to come up with rapid response technologies to go after Ebola. Um, and this was the uh, thinking in terms of this rapid response technology is how can we essentially almost in a, in a computer uh, design, build, and discover novel compounds to emerging biological threats. And um, we're certainly experiencing that right now with COVID. And how can we take that technology and actually translate it into novel chemical matter? And primarily at MIT, we've been focused on drug leads, but we're also learning the compounds that we discover can be used as diagnostics too. And so I think that's, that's also going to be just as important. And so these molecules that we ultimately produce need to be functional. They need to be stable. So we don't want them to be, have to be stored in a refrigerator, for instance. You want to be able to have these as powders that can be shipped all over the U.S., if not the world, so that people can have access to these compounds on demand. And also, you want to build in your design elements such that you don't elicit an immune response. And so we want these new compounds we make to be non-immunogenic. And so this has been our marching order for, for the past five years in my lab at MIT. And what we're learning is that we can start to really think about this, but we have a long way to go. And we really tested our platform with this uh, coronavirus outbreak. But we're in a much stronger position than we were when we started building these things uh, and going after Ebola. And so just to give you the, the issue here, it comes down to time. And that the current timeline in drug discovery and development, essentially, you know, as we're all experiencing, and actually, I really is, am being nice when I say months. It's actually more like years, right? Uh, at least in the academic labs when we're doing, you know, really high risk discovery efforts and so forth. It can take months to screen and sequence and discover new compounds. Now you go to synthesize them, and that's a tremendous effort too. And then really doing the testing and validation, that's also a significant amount of time and money and resources. And sometimes, unfortunately, if your rationale and your, and your science isn't uh, 
you know, guiding enough, you have to go back to the beginning. And that's a real major challenge. And so our goal, and it's been longstanding, is to move, move the timeline where you can get this down uh, into days. And that's certainly ever more important with what we're going through right now. And so uh, this has been the, uh, the charge of my group. And um, what's just started to emerge, and we just actually had the first real paper on this come out in Nature Communications during, during this um, the shutdown, is really how do, we, how do we take a 100 million member compound library? And that's what we can do right now. We want to get to a billion member compounds, but we're, we're at about 100 million. And we want to be able to have a high level of design features in these libraries that we made, these chemical libraries. And when we make these libraries, a big question mark is, do any of these members have the desired function? And so we'll go ahead and do what's called an enrichment step, in which we'll take that large bucket of molecules and we'll go ahead and incubate it, mix it in with our coronavirus spike protein, for instance. And then we'll enrich for everything in that large, vast mixture that actually has high affinity high interaction with that target protein. And the hope is, is that serves as a novel drug lead. And so the way we go ahead and figure out what in fact was associating with our protein target, in this case, the coronavirus protein, we'll use mass spectrometry to do that in the gas phase. And we'll do a round of sequencing and synthesis and validation to really inform us um, from what we've discovered and think about whether or not we can use this to combat infection. And also what's going on, and we've really hunkered down to understand this with uh, Rafael Barrielli Gomez in the Materials uh, Science Department at MIT, is how can we build in a, a computational platform, a machine learning platform that can even start to tell us how to make these libraries based on the protein that we wanna target? How can we better decode and understand our drug lead? And then how can we further validate and really close this loop and accelerate our pace in which we discover these compounds. And so this is really, you know, leveraging the, the transformation that's undergoing at MIT with the College of Computing. And we're really excited about this. We think we're going to be able to build this into the, into the platform to really streamline our efforts. And so one of the things is not only how you discover these compounds, but if you've ever gone in the laboratory and made, made molecules using chemistry, it takes a lot of time. So that's a, another area that I think is really important to accelerate our drug discovery efforts. And so uh, we've been working on this rapid response chemistry um, uh, synthesizer, this so-called protein printer. Uh, this is the design features of the machine. It sits in a fume hood. Um, you're not quite on your iPhone to run it yet, but we're getting there. Um, essentially, it has 50 different reagents charged on this machine which are delivered into the reaction chamber by pumps. And when the chemistry takes place, we get feedback in real time and regarding its efficiency. And so at the end of the day, the take home is that we can in fact now make molecules, peptides and proteins in minutes to hours. It's really exciting. Our latest work was just published in Science a few weeks ago. And so just to show you how when we discover these new drug leads using that platform I mentioned, we actually walk up to this machine. We like to call it the amidator uh, after the terminator because it, it's so fast and it forms these amid bonds, which are very important for the types of molecules that we make. It does it exceptionally fast in minutes. So these are all your amino acids. And essentially what this machine's doing is it's delivering all these amino acids through these reactors over here such that you can, in a sense, print your molecule. And so it's really exciting. We've made over 500 different compounds uh, since the laboratory or since uh, coronavirus outbreak. And we're, we're testing them to understand their activity and whether or not we can start to use them as a potential therapeutic or a diagnostic. And so this is just showing the layout. And this is a neat thing about MIT, you know, if, from your experience with them is not only do we do outstanding science and engineering, but we bring it all together so that we can really have trend, uh, large impact and so you punch in your sequence and essentially that's your string of amino acids and you go ahead and hit go. And this machine, this is all computer controlled, will go ahead and deliver reagents into that reaction vessel. And it does it in such a manner that it's 99.9% .9 efficient for every single step. And it can do up to 260 consecutive chemical reactions in a row. 
And as I said, you can see in real time the efficiency of the chemistry that you're actually performing. So we use this to make all these new compounds that we've discovered thus far. When it's finished, it opens up and you go ahead and grab this disposable reactor and you do some downstream processing so that you can go ahead and test this compound. And so we're really in, in, you know, leveraging these technologies and, and thinking about a rapid response to COVID. And so we have three major campaigns in the laboratory right now. As Laura talked about, the glycans on the spike protein that's essential for entry of coronavirus into human cells is very important. And so we've been making these uh, alpha helical uh, memetics of the ACE2 uh, receptor as a means to hopefully outcompete for entry into host cells and, and to uh, attenuate or even um, diminish infectivity. These compounds are also being thought of as being used as prophylactics. So hopefully topicals in, in your nasal or, or throat or even skin to hopefully combat the virus infectivity. We're also going after the entire spike protein. So we have campaigns trying to bind to other regions to perhaps say inhibit fusion, a critical step for entry into cells that Mei Hong just talked about. And lastly, we're exploring the notion of just saturating the ACE2 receptors that are on the host cells and not allowing the, the coronavirus actually to infect these cells. And we have some really promising uh, new drug leads in that, in, that, in that area. And so this is just a little snippet of the remarkable work our team and collaborators have been going on, working on. And uh, we thank you for taking your time out today to hear about what's underway at MIT. All right, well, thank you, Brad. Um, we've got a number of questions ready queued up for you. So, um, so one question that came up is what's wonder, people wondering what scale you're doing this sort of discover synthesis at? Is it at the sort of milligram, microgram, nanogram scale? Uh, um, yeah. So, okay. So the discovery engine. Uh, so what's really remarkable here is we're working with a hundred million uh, membered libraries. So any individual molecule is actually a picomolar concentrations. And so the real challenge why people haven't been able to do this is because there's all levels of sensitivity. How do you actually really detect such a low amount of molecule when it associates with your protein target of interest, the receptor binding domain, for instance, of coronavirus. And so that's where we've really had to work hard to get our sensitivities on our mass specs and so forth way down and really be able to leverage that sensitivity to discover these new compounds. But when we go to go ahead and make the molecules at a, at a level that's required for biological investigation, our default synthesis scales are 10, 10 milligrams, 100 milligrams. And then on that machine that I showed you, we can even upscale. We can go up to gram quantity syntheses without um, any uh, detriment to the synthesis time. So that's really a, a great thing. Um, that machine that we, I showed you is so fast. If you run it in repeat mode, we can even make kilogram amounts of material. So we think um, there's some opportunity there that we've certainly discussed this with the NIH um, and delivering them gram quantities of some of these molecules because it just takes people in the world too much time to make these. And they don't, of course, they can't wait. And so these are some of the, some of the things that we have uh, at MIT. Uh, great, and I'll I'll come I'll give one last one question that's going to combine two here, sort of. Uh, and it was questions about the capabilities of what you can make uh, with this, and, and that is, uh, first of all, can you uh, incorporate non-natural amino acids uh, into this? And the other question is related to geometry. You know, to what extent can you are you predicting geometry as opposed to just sequence? Uh, and uh, you know, could you do? Uh, you know, could you, could you try to create a particular peptide sequence that had a particular geometry? Yeah. So uh, as far as we can tell, I mean, there's thousands of non-natural amino acids now. Um, our machine holds 50 different chemical reagents at any given time. Um, we haven't had any challenges with many of the non-natural amino acids that we've investigated. Um, and so we're, we're really excited about that. You can change the chemistry too if you have to adapt it to some some things that are a little bit uh, sensitive, say to temperature and so forth, but it has a, it has a, a broad reaction scope, I would say. Um, in terms of building in extra design elements for the libraries, that's the future. So we call this the privileged monomers, the privileged shapes. And so that's where the machine learning and all the computation comes in is how do we actually look at the protein target of interest 
and then start to think about the shapes and the design elements of the libraries that we want to build in so that we can bias the enrichment outcomes. And so that's exactly what we see as nature is done. It has all these different shapes. There's 10,000 of them. And essentially you mix them all together and you get this beautiful thing called life. Um, how do we start to think about that from a computational and discovery perspective? And that's exactly, that's the future of this. And I, I think that will only streamline our efforts It'll really allow us to go on target in a much more rapid manner and, and hopefully get us through our days that's required for discovery. All right, and last question, uh, which is, uh, how do you pur purify your proteins uh, of their, from yeah. their impurities? Uh, and can you do that as quickly as you make them? Yeah, yeah. So, so right now in the laboratory, we're at hours of synthesis of a protein. So if anybody knows about this, um, you go to bacteria or mammalian cell expressions, you rely on the ribosome and the DNA and so, so forth. Um, so we're, we're, getting, we're getting there. We're, we're doing quite good. Uh, when you do chemistry to make a protein, you got to do a folding reaction. Um, all proteins have different folding kinetics. So sometimes that takes, uh, you know, it's minutes, sometimes it's hours. And uh, if it's days, we usually try to accelerate that. So the folding time is still in line with the synthesis time. So that's great. And the purification is, is uh, really protein dependent. It can be as fast as, as, you know, 20, 30 minutes. In other cases, it can be a few hours. Um, so it's not um, largely different from the synthesis timeline. So, so everything lines up well. Um, and, and, you know, we really are excited about this technology and what it's going to bring to the world for, for understanding these, these molecules and, and using them as therapeutics. All right. Well, thank you, Brad. There's still more questions, but I'll, we'll have to move on to the next speaker. So let's uh, give Brad a, a virtual round of applause. Um, and we'll move on to our next speaker, Alex Stalek, uh, and I'll, I'll hand, the, hand the virtual podium over to you, Alex. Podium over to you, Alex. Thanks, Troy. Can you hear me and see my slides? Perfect. Uh, hi, I'm Alex Stalek. I'd like to thank the department for the opportunity to present and you all for joining us today. Today, I'm hoping to briefly discuss how we've been using single cell genomics to try and gain understanding into COVID-19. As I'm sure you're all aware, let me move this out of the way so I can see my cursor. So I'm sure you're all aware, clinically, COVID-19 is characterized by a wide range of symptoms, ranging from cough to shortness of breath uh, to things like diarrhea. Meanwhile, as was mentioned by my colleagues, um, at the molecular level, the virus that causes COVID-19 relies on two host factors, the surface receptor ACE2 and the protease TMPRSS2, um, in order to enter host cells. To bridge the gap between these two observations, we and others have been eager to identify what are the cell types in each of our tissues that actually express these two factors, ACE2 and TMPRSS2, and thus might be viral targets, and to explore how viral infection might impact different tissues. So the question is, how might we go about identifying this? Well, if we think about the tissues within our bodies, each of them is comprised of a variety of different cell types that work together to perform essential functions. So for example, in the lung, you have epithelial cells, immune cells, muscle cells, endothelial cells, and others, um, collectively facilitating oxygen exchange and more. Uh, but if we only have one genome, you might ask, how do we actually get this diversity of different cell types from what we've inherited from our parents? Well, the answer is we utilize different parts of that genome. To enable the unique functionality um, each of the cells within our body makes mRNA copies of specific genes that can be translated into proteins that are essential for that cell's function. By looking at the patterns of different mRNAs that are contained in each of our individual cells, we can gauge what the role of that cell might be and whether or not it may in fact be a viral target. So how do we go about then quantifying what the mRNAs within these cells are? Well, over the past decade, there have been transformative advances in molecular biology and micro nanotechnologies pioneered in part by my lab and others that have enabled us to now isolate individual cells, reverse transcribe all the messages within that cell using the fact that they have a common feature, a polyadenylation signal, to then amplify and sequence to detect what those transcripts are. And one thing that I should note is that actually this can similarly be used to co-detect um, viral nucleic acids that have these polyadenylation signals. So over the past several years, my lab has applied this approach to look at many different tissues across many different diseases. And so as soon as we heard that ACE2 and TMPRSS2 were essential host factors, what we were able to do was to quickly go look back at some of our existing data sets to figure out what are the cell types that actually express them. So looking, for example, at some data that we collected from non-human primate lung, where we could run some of these technologies on it, 
we were able to look at data that we had generated where we found a variety of different cell types and then look at where we were detecting these two particular transcripts that are essential. And what we found is that among this wide variety of cells, it was actually only a very small population in the upper part right here in these type 2 pneumocytes that were expressing these two transcripts. As we looked across different tissues and different model systems, it turned out that it was always a needle in a haystack. In the lung, it was type 2 pneumocytes. In the gut, it was a specific population called absorptive enterocytes. Um, but you know, it was, it was always an infrequent population, which accounted for only a few percent of all cells. And digging deeper into some of our existing data sets and running a few additional experiments, um, we found a couple additional essential things, like the fact that the virus may actually hijack host defenses. And that's because this surface receptor, ACE2, is actually stimulated by interferon, which is released in response to viral infection. And that some of the models that we commonly use to actually go look at drugs and vaccines uh, like mouse models and cell lines actually fail to recapitulate essential features of disease. But what this told us by looking at our existing data was really only what might be targeted, not actually what was and what the impact of infection was. Those are things that we really need to know if we want to develop better vaccines and cures. So in order to start to identify what are the cells that might actually be targeted, we've partnered with a number of people around Boston, um, looking at the Broad Institute and the surrounding hospitals, to look at tissues collected from COVID-19 autopsy cases. And what this has enabled us to do is to look at all the different cell types that exist within these tissues and identify shifts that are occurring in disease, to identify in these human tissues what are the cells that express the specific host factors that are essential for infection, and to also map on which cells harbor viral RNA. Um, and those are the COVID positive ones that I'm showing you over on this side. And critically, what this information is starting to give us a, wind a window into is what cells are permissive, which cells are resistant, and to suggest ways that we might actually intervene to block viral replication and prevent severe disease. So right now what we're doing is we're actually working with a number of collaborators in Boston and around the globe to try and gather information that's critical to understand disease pathogenesis and realize cures and preventions. Some questions that we're working on with a number of colleagues are trying to understand what is actually happening in different tissues and severe disease so that we can figure out ways to mitigate it, to understand what happens in infected and bystander cells during infection, um, to look at why some people are, have a greater risk of developing severe disease, um, you know, whether this is uh, people who are elderly or the like, to understand why some populations like pediatric cohorts seemingly are resistant to severe infection, and then equally critically to figure out what are the appropriate animal models to recapitulate some features of human disease, since it turns out that uh, different models uh, enable us to model different pieces of what we're after and are going to be essential for getting the right drugs and compounds. Finally, a really important and central part of the work that we've been doing is to create resources and to share data very rapidly. What's been amazing, if we're thinking about silver linings of um, the current pandemic, is the way in which the scientific community has rallied together and has openly shared data. Normally, this type of data is not shared in advance of publication, but everybody's been putting all of their data up as quickly as possible so that the entire global scientific community can work together to tackle uh, COVID-19. So I want to emphasize that this has been and will continue to be a large collaboration with a number of individuals and institutions around the Boston area, as well as part of a larger worldwide collaboration to target COVID-19. I want to thank everybody who's worked tirelessly um, during these unprecedented times to make this work possible and give my sincere thanks to all the donors and their families um, who've enabled us to understand what the impact of severe disease is so that we can hopefully ensure that there will be few cases in the future. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions and thank you again for uh, joining us today. Well, thank you, Alex. Virtual round of applause for Alex. Um, so going straight to the questions, uh, there's one here uh, asking, does your, does your cellular modeling explain the difference in pediatric and adult infectivity rates and disease progression? Uh, so it's a fantastic question. Um, the data that's been collected from, um, not from, from COVID-19, but uh, from existing data sets suggest that there are lower levels of expression of ACE2 and TMPRSS2 in children, which suggests why they may be less susceptible to disease. Now, um, we have some studies that we're doing in collaboration with partners at Boston Children's Hospital to look at actual tissue samples collected from pediatric cohorts to identify um, what is actually happening during infection. And we're going to compare that over to what we're seeing in adults to gain a better understanding of why there may be more severe disease in adults on average than in children. 
Uh, here's someone whose eyesight is better than mine. Uh, they, they, meant, they noted from looking at your slides that it seems that the cells expressing receptors needed for infection don't necessarily overlap with the cells that have SARS-CoV-2 RNA. And is that a technical artifact? I, I wasn't even able to see that, that level of detail. It's, so it's, uh, it's a great attention to detail. And actually, it's a really important point. One of the things that you have to do in order to do these measurements on single cells is you need viable cells with viable mRNA. And when a cell dies, one of the first things that happens is the RNA degrades and it's no longer detectable. So actually, some of those populations of cells that we think are being infected are dying and therefore we're not detecting it. What we're doing is we're matching this with some in situ profiling and some protein measurements um, to get around that. And I also would say a lot of what we're doing is at the RNA level because we have sort of these ubiquitous probes that enable us to look at all of the RNA, but sometimes RNA and protein don't match. Um, and actually what's interesting in that figure is one of the places where we see a lot of viral reads is in the macrophage populations. And we're not 100% sure yet whether they're eating infected cells or whether or not they may actually be uh, Trojan horses bringing some of the virus uh, to other cells within the tissue. So still things to work through there. All right. Uh, and then uh, one more question. of COVID seems to lead to a high incidence of thrombosis, both arterial and venous. Uh, any evidence that the virus specifically attacks vascular endothelium? So it's, it's a great question. Actually, one of the most surprising things that we've seen, and this is all small numbers of data, yet is in looking at uh, the autopsies, there's been a tremendous number of endothelial cells. So we've seen a tremendous amount of vasculature relative to what we would normally see in this tissue. And there have been some reports that you know, came out in the New England Journal, for example, suggesting that this is a feature of severe disease. Now, how it all plays in to drive, uh, to drive what's happening, it's not 100% clear yet, but we are seeing evidence of increased uh, endothelial cells. And in some complications, like where it's targeting the heart, it does look like it is the endothelial cells in the heart that are actually becoming infected. Okay. And then one last question, which isn't necessarily strictly on the science, but I think is important for everyone, which is that there's a question here of whether, whether, all, whether your labs were operating all through the COVID crisis or whether you, whether you shut down. So I, I think, you know. so, so this is a great question. You know, it's, I, everybody in the lab was obviously incredibly excited to volunteer to be part of this work. And everybody, I was you know, thrilled by the number of people that wanted to take place in this research. On the other hand, you know, we know that social distancing and minimizing interactions is one of the best ways of preventing spread. And you want to make sure that you minimize risk to everybody that's involved. So what the lab, what my lab is focused on is actually trying to help with the parts that we're uniquely enabled to do. And so connecting with colleagues all around the area and trying to put together super teams that involve you know, collaborators at the hospitals and at Broad. So it's a little bit from everywhere to do some synergistic research. Um, and like Brad, I check in with my team every morning at 8.30. We have these morning calls where we make sure we're on top of everything. Um, but we've maintained a small skeleton crew of about you know three-ish people across our different sites coordinating very effectively to make sure that there's minimal overlap and trying to make sure that it's always voluntary and that nobody feels pressured to do this because at the end of the day uh, the health and welfare of the students is the most important thing um, yeah that's great all right well thank you alex uh, again let's give him a round of applause and now i invite uh, our final speaker tim swagger to to come to the mic uh, and uh, take it away tim okay thanks troy um yes it's just been very educational it's uh, one of the great things about mit is just the intellectual firepower that's just just blasting around you all the time and even for like example myself who has no real uh, training in the biological sciences, it's possible to do things at those interfaces when you're surrounded by other great people that, you know, teach you things constantly. And so, uh, so that's one of the real pleasures of being at MIT and enabling uh, me to do things that I couldn't have conceived of doing anywhere else. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about uh, what we do with what we call uh, dynamic droplets or dynamic liquid liquid colloids. And uh, just maybe something for the breakout section if you're interested, you may uh, try and guess how I made this first pitch. Well, I didn't make how this first picture was made. Uh, I like it because it looks like a bunch of flying saucers attacking uh, in an old science fiction movie. But uh, why we're interested in these types of liquid liquid materials is that in fact, you know, if you look at the cell, uh, in cells, they have a liquid crystalline uh, boundary. It's a phospholipid membrane, 
and uh, it's very dynamic. And in fact, is this is something Laura has been really a pioneer on and looking at these carbohydrates and things as they decorate all the proteins around and they're, they're like little icebergs floating around and when things come together, they can move. So it's very different than traditional assays wherein things are stapled to a surface. So this, so if we can now start to make uh, uh, essentially sensors, uh, something I, my group, group uh, focuses on, that make use of this dynamic interface, um, that'll, that's something that we think we can make higher fidelity sensors and maintain the kind of properties of the recognition elements and get higher uh, fidelity. So how we go about doing this? Well, we needed a few different things. And, and one that we needed was to use these multiple phases in these liquid-liquid droplets. So what I'm showing here is uh, polydispersed droplets. We can make them monodispersed, so I'll show you in a minute. But the red uh, portion is a hydrocarbon phase that is dyed with a red dye. And the surrounding area is a fluorocarbon. And so we can use surfactants and different surface tensions to control these structures. And, um, and we can make more complex ones, but today I'm only gonna tell you about the fluorocarbon, hydrocarbon water one. And these are again dispersed in water, so they're floating around like little cells, little dynamic cells. And we wanna make them monodisperse, we uh, use microfluidics. And here is just a, a chip that's showing, uh, making these different droplets, we can control their sizes uh, with great precision. Uh, but what really is the magic that makes these droplets really useful for making uh, chemical sensor or biological sensors is the fact that they are lenses, okay? And so what I'm showing here is just a, a photos, one through uh, seven here, of different morphologies of these droplets, red, again, seeing the hydrocarbon phase. The fluorocarbon phase is on the bottom because it's denser. So these also auto-align with gravity. So these are side-on microscope images. We have made a little microscope to take pictures of side-on of these. And uh, when you have light transmitting through them, you can see that with the perfect Janus, it's a perfect you know, two hemis hemispheres put together, the light is collimated. That is, it can transmit an image through it. But you can see over here at the left side that you get a focusing condition. And so even if I were to kind of give you flashcards with droplets one through three, I'm not sure you would be able to tell the difference between them, but you can see the focusing condition changes quite dramatically. And on the other side, we get dispersive optics. And so we make use of a lot of these different optics. I'm only gonna show you one very simple one today that makes use of this collimated light. That is when droplets are aligned, images can flow through them, but when they basically are uh, knocked off that alignment, they do not transmit images. So it's very similar to a privacy screen that you get on your laptop. Okay, so, and I should mention, I was, I was aided in this by Matthias Kola, who is a, uh, a professor in uh, mechanical engineering. Okay, so now on to some things that you've, you've heard about. Laura, this is actually work that was really kind of inspired by a lot of what Laura does. Uh, we put mannos on our uh, droplets to begin with because it turns out that lectins on a lot of uh, pathogenic organisms bind mannose. So we just made the simplest possible surfactant we can, and we put it on the hydrocarbon phase. Again, there's a fluorocarbon surfactant in there. And the idea is that you can get these multivalent interactions that are known to be uh, part of viruses and how they infect. And so uh, we made use of uh, one of these um, these uh, lectin uh, binding domains, it looks actually was on Laura, one of Laura's slides, concanaplin A, and uh, we can use that to show how we can make a sensor. And so this is just a, a molecular construct, uh, but what we have is we initially have our droplets, and this is a microscope image from the top, and this is a side-on kind of rendering, and you can see they're all aligned here. We can't really see the, these interface here because we're looking top down on them, uh, but if you just put some concanavalin in there and give them a little tap, the concanavalin binds the mannose. It's a tetrameric protein, so it can bind four equivalents of mannose, and it essentially glues them together. And so ordinarily, without concanavalin, you could tap them, they would, they would rock over, and then they'd rock back, kind of like weevils wobble, but they don't fall down. Uh, but when you have this in there, they get stuck together, and this is an agglutination event. And why this is important is this gives a very strong optical signal, okay? So... So what you can do is you can take a QR code, we put the aligned droplets over the top of the QR code, 
And then we put some E. coli in that binds mannose, uh, a variant, uh, at least different ones that haven't, or it hasn't been mutated. We did control experiments for ones that were mutated. And we give it just a little, or give it a tap or two, all at once we see that we get a cloudy image, which is not readable. And uh, that is because of all this high degree of scattering. Now, another thing that we can do, this is just a threshold detection with your smartphone. So you can tell if you have certain threshold, it's not as sensitive as you might like. But the fact that we have that these agglutination events are so strong optically, we can actually pick them out with this simple imaging with a, with a, with a magnifying glass on your smartphone. You can, these are about 50 micron uh, plus droplets here. And you can basically image these and count the number of agglutinations. And then you can get actually quantitative data that gives you an, an, a measure of how many uh, you know, pathogenic organisms you have in there. And we've extended this to uh, Listeria as well as Salmonella. Okay, so we've done different pathogenic organisms. In uh, other cases, we, we actually have used antibodies here. So this is just showing kind of an antibody assay. We, we essentially affix antibodies to the surfaces here. And with a pathogenic organism, they align. Now, one of the things that we do in this, we get a little bit, uh, we, we put some extra elements in it because fluorocarbons and hydrocarbons are emissible, we can actually design dyes and, that are soluble only in one of the two phases. So we can put a very dark dye that absorbs all the light in the top phase. Again, remember these, these orient with gravity because fluorocarbon is more dense. And uh, we can put a red emitting dye in the other phase. And so when you look at this from the top, you can see that when we when we do it without a dye, we'll see the red dye from underneath, but we put this blocking dye that was made by somebody named Zach, and that's why we call it the Zach dye. Uh, it basically blocks all of the light and you don't see the light. But when these things agglutinate around a pathogen, they get tipped on their sides, okay? And so these are some polydispersed organisms. Uh, droplets, excuse me. So you can see that the red color now gives very uh, dramatic contrast and you can read that with a smartphone or you can actually measure the fluorescence just using a bifurcated fiber optic and make little sensors. You can do this with, with essentially uh, of, of LEDs and photodiodes too. So you can make little cheap little devices that can do this. And we're in the process of commu uh, commercializing this for food pathogens. Uh, so on to COVID, just uh, very, very briefly, we, 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 uh, we started working on this with, with two students in the lab. Uh, a little bit before the opening here, we had took a while to get approved, but we, we got a little bit of a head start there on that. And we have shown that we can make uh, new antibody assays. And so Laura mentioned the antibody assays right now are, uh, although they can have some sensitivity, they, they are not entirely reliable. In fact, is I think, you know, one, one of the things that we need to do is we need to start putting some of these lectins in there to see if we can actually, uh, you know, essentially double down on this. But we have a few tricks on how we got the antibody assay to work. We have a viable antibody assay that makes use of its agglutination method. We think we can reduce it to a smartphone type system that has, you know, a high fidelity and ideally, um, you know, higher sensitivity. Uh, we're working on ways to make uh, multiplex assays. So again, there's more than one protein target uh, when you look at antibodies for uh, the, the SARS protein, the SARS proteins are more uh, different uh, antigens for that. And so we'd also like to look at things other than just the IgG, the IgA, and the IgM. These, these actually are multi-oligomeric uh, in nature. They are very different and they get expressed kind of earlier in the infection process. So we have this one ongoing. And you can see that by using different color dyes, we can multiplex this this is showing side on image, but this is kind of a top down image. And you can see how we could use color coding here between different dyes to actually get at a multiplexed uh, uh, assay that can determine all these at the same time. And then another thing that's very much in, in, in progress, uh, in fact, is I was hoping to be able to show you about it today, is to directly detect the virus itself. And here we can, we can use uh, antibodies that you can buy, but we're also using engineered proteins from Hadley Sykes Group. She's in chemical engineering. She was, Highlighted, if you're interested, go back to the MIT website. She's been highlighted about what she's been doing in this area. Some fascinating stuff. But again, the SARS protein has 60 copies of the spike protein. If you basically have something that binds the spike, 
you can see how you can get agglutination type events here shown in a kind of animation video. We're also working very actively with Bevan Engelward, who is in bioengineering, who is also helping us on uh, all of these types of antibody assays. Um, so with that, it's just time for me to uh, thank the wonderful team of students we have at MIT. Uh, they, you know, I may have a little bit more experience, but I would say uh, the brain power, average brain power in this group vastly exceeds my own. And that's really a fascinating thing. All we have to do is be good managers, wind them up and put them in the right direction. And, and most importantly, keep the money flowing. That's uh, something that, uh, so that they get paid and they have the tools to do what they need to do. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for showing up today. I'd like to thank my colleagues for educating me and all of you and welcome any questions you might have. Thank you, Tim. Uh, round of virtual applause for Tim. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and, and jump in with a question, Tim, which is, uh, you know, so this is partly my ignorance, which is I don't know for most of these pathogens, you know, for the tests that are out there now, if you're trying to detect uh, COVID-19 or Listeria or, or E. coli, you know, how do those tests work? And then how does the, the technology you're proposing, you know, compare to that, you know, and how long it takes or its sensitivity or those kinds of things? Well, I mean, I think it's, an, first of all, I think it's a rapidly evolving area. So there's lots of stuff in play. Uh, but the uh, tests uh, were, were basically uh, genomic tests where you use a polymerase chain reaction. You take, you're, you're looking at the, 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 um, the, 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 the uh, DNA of the virus or the RNA of the virus. And then you're basically uh, essentially amplifying that up and detecting it. That's one way you can do it. People are working on lateral flow assays. You think very similar to the pregnant home pregnancy test. That's the way the antibody assays work, where you basically pick things up. It is very similar to, uh, Laura had a scheme that looked very similar to how this might work, where you get capture on a surface and you use uh, usually uh, scattering of gold particles, for example, where it can be luminescent uh, to actually do this and you have a control and an active line and those are the ways that a lot of the uh, uh, antibody assays are working. Um, again, I think there's room for improvement of all that. And one of the things I think we're gonna see out of this is like, uh, you know, beyond our own work, there are many innovations going on in this area all across uh, uh, the world. And I think it's gonna have long-term impact in, in healthcare and uh, home diagnostics also. Uh, another question, to use this methodology clinically, would it be necessary to centrifuge off the cells and just use the plasma? In which case, what volume of sample would be needed to do this kind of a test on the plasma? Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, so we usually just, uh, uh, we, we have done uh, measurements on plasma and found that it's not, uh, it doesn't interfere. And so we can do that. Uh, one of the tricks we use uh, is we can do a bottom. So if you, one of the issues when you do an optical method is just scattering events. So if you have a lot of stuff in there, you can get scattering. And so we can do the measurement from the bottom. Okay, so our droplets are heavier than water. We can essentially mix them, let them settle, and then we can make a measurement from the bottom. We actually just have to invert the drop. The, the dyes I showed you were top-faced. I could, we just changed make different dyes with different orthogonal solubilities and switch it around and we can do that. Now in terms of the, the, the volume, I mean the more sensitive you are, if you, the, the smaller the volume, but also if you go with small enough volumes you have a chance of missing things. So just for example in our, wor in our work in, in food pathogens, we try and get as large a volume as possible. You can sometimes, uh, people do things where they concentrate uh, uh, organisms uh, prior to uh, exposing them to a sensor. We are trying to avoid that. We want as simple a workflow as possible. And so uh, um, for home diagnostics, it's going to be, you know, where if you're taking blood, if you're doing a stereological test of antibodies, obviously you don't want to take much blood. So it's going to be pretty small amounts there, you know, uh, uh, microliters tops. Uh, and a few microliters will be, be in that case. But for other cases we could use, we have methods to do much larger volumes. We essentially can agitate it, let everything fall to the bottom. We, we have uh, 
uh, demonstrated we can sample very large volumes if need be. That, that right. might well, be there's a bunch of the, just one thing that might be interesting if you're looking for environmental, like so if you have if you have COVID yeah, or something coming in some sort of environmental sample, that's what you might want. Well, there's several other questions in the Q&A, but for the, in the interest of time, I'm gonna, gonna close out this Q&A and just thank you again, Tim. Um, and on behalf of the Department of Chemistry and the MIT Alumni Association, thanks to all of you for tuning into this Faculty Forum Online Special Edition. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our loyal donors. We rely heavily on the generosity of our alumni and friends to keep our chemistry program competitive as we continue to educate the next generation of superlative chemists. Uh, and this work would not have been possible without you. So thank you. Uh, now I invite you to please send any additional comments or questions about this event to alumnilearn at mit.edu. Uh, and our team will now open breakouts uh, with our individual faculty uh, for additional conversation. And in particular, I know that there were a number of questions for each of the talks that we didn't have time for in the Q&A. Uh, we want to thank you for those questions and encourage you to go to the breakout rooms and ask your questions there. Uh, a reminder that this broadcast will be available on the Alum MIT Alumni Association YouTube channel when all the results revealed in this presentation have been published. Uh, and so thank you again for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure sharing with you some of the cutting edge research being carried out at, uh, in the Department of Chemistry at MIT. Thank you again and take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.